Hunt Showdown, The Cycle, Marauders, Grey Zone Warfare, Arena Breakout Infinite, Call of Duty DMZ, and Escape from Tarkov. What do all these games have in common? They're all extraction shooters. Half of these games that I just listed are dead, if not on their way to being dead. But one of them seems to stand the test of time. Even though this specific game has had nothing but controversy after controversy, players boycotting the game, the game being riddled with bugs, the servers almost constantly on fire, and the devs never really getting a hold of the cheating situation. If you haven't guessed by now, the game I'm talking about is Escape from Tarkov. Today I want to do a deep dive into the extraction shooter genre and discuss the reasons why most extraction shooters seem to fail and why these issues don't seem to affect Tarkov. Just a disclaimer, this isn't meant to be a video that takes shots at other games. If you enjoy these games, I have nothing against you. And personally, I've played all these games. It's just a discussion on why these games seem to lose their player base. Again, it's nothing personal and I'm not trying to be toxic by any measure. With that out of the way, let's jump right in. Before we can get into the meat of the video and why I think that most of these extraction shooters lost their player base, we've got to go back to the start, when the extraction shooter craze began. August of 2016, when a little game called Escape from Tarkov's Alpha was released. But the game didn't really seem to hit its stride until the closed beta, which happened in July of 2017. To say the least, the game was a janky piece of shit, but the premise was really enticing which drew in more and more players over the years. An extraction-based shooter with a raid system that was not only PvE, but also PvP. Escape from Tarkov is the granddaddy of extraction shooters. BSG carved out a little piece of the gaming industry for themselves and pioneered the genre. Some people might say that Hunt Showdown was the first, but EFT came up before that, and I'm not really here to debate that. Regardless, Hunt Showdown was the next extraction shooter to pop up in the list shooting its way into early access on February of 2018. With it came an entirely new game with its own story, characters, and mechanics. Out of all the extraction shooters on this list, I think Hunt Showdown is the most healthy. They're not failing by any measure, in fact they seem to be trending upwards as far as player count goes, and I'm happy to see that. I think that Hunt Showdown is a special kind of extraction shooter that you don't see very often, set in the Old West with supernatural elements and an anxiety-filled atmosphere almost like a horror game with its own jump scares and not only from AI enemies but also players who get to jump on you. I'm not going to go too deep into this game, at some point I'd love to do an actual review on it, but for now I want to talk about some of its strengths and weaknesses. Strengths, incredible sound design, enthralling and fun gameplay, a large weapon selection, a variety of playstyles to choose from, microtransactions that aren't pay to win, and a great dev team that seems to listen to their community. 
Weaknesses. Annoying ass bugs. Really bad UI that everyone seems to complain about. Cheaters in a toxic player base. But a couple of these things are found in pretty much every single multiplayer game, so take that with a grain of salt. In closing, I think that Hunt Showdown has a very bright future, and it seems that even with controversy, the game continues to gain players. And if anyone's wondering, this is what a healthy game trend looks like. They lose players and gain players, hovering at a decent 29k players on average. To put that into context, Destiny 2 has 40k players on average, which is universally accepted as a healthy game. Following Hunt Showdown, The Cycle of Frontier was released into Early Access in August of 2019, and this game was very promising at the start. The game had a sci-fi aesthetic and it took you to a completely different planet called Fortuna 3. Instead of loading into a raid like you would EFT or Hunt, you're placed into a drop pod, crash landing into a planet of unknown origin. The game had all your favorite mechanics in an extraction shooter. It had shooting, looting, and most certainly, scooting, but some of the combat felt kind of janky and the game felt very meh. When you were in an intense situation, the game felt great, but in the in-betweens, it kind of felt slow. So let's talk about some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses. Strengths. Exciting and intense gunfights, new and interesting mechanics such as blackout storms, unique monsters, a persistent world that doesn't reset every match, an interesting art style, and it was fairly polished as far as bugs go. Weaknesses. Bad company management that eventually stopped the development of the game. Game was overrun by cheaters. No end game and the MMR system was a joke. All of these weaknesses alone could have crippled the game, but it was the perfect storm of all these things that really put it in the ground. The ironic thing was that they even boasted about their anti-cheat, as if they were the ones that were leading the charge, but in the end they were subject to cheating just as any other game was, if not worse. It sucks because the cycle had some really creative and unique ideas. One mechanic I wish that Tarkai would have taken note of was the mechanic where you could see all of the players you were in the vicinity of after the raid. Even if they didn't attack you, you could still see their name. And I thought that was groundbreaking and it blew my fucking mind when I saw it for the first time. After the release of the cycle, we had Marauders that made its way into early access on October 3rd of 2022. Like the other games that we just discussed, Marauders was a departure from Escape from Tarkov. Instead of it being set in the modern day with modern weapons, we were met with an interesting, depressing landscape where the Great War never ended and the Earth had become uninhabitable. Taking to the stars, you and your pirate crew kill or steal from other players by either launching at blistering speeds into their ship or taking them out on a nearby space station. Either way, the battles were always intense and even harder to learn. They took the approach of show not tell, much like EFT, and the maps and locations were like mazes, and they took a while to get down. I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this game, and I honestly wish that it still had a thriving player base, but recent trends show that they've been having a hard time cracking even 200 players, which is sad because this game was truly unique and it only came out two years ago. So let's talk about the strengths and unfortunately the weaknesses of the game. The game had unique ships, you could pilot your own vessel with up to 3 players, you can unlock different clothing options at higher levels, the crafting system was interesting, and it had such an intense atmosphere that you could cut it with a butter knife at any given point. Weaknesses The weapons and melee felt completely broken, annoying slow movement that felt claustrophobic, plenty of bugs to go around, bad price point, cheaters were running rampant, and the anti-cheat was false flagging known large content creators and the devs refused to unban them. This is even worse in a toxic community. <laughs> really? <laughs> but what's crazy is that I've heard of this somewhere else, and I'll elaborate on that later. Rotters was an interesting extraction shooter and I wish that they found their footing, but clearly they didn't. And I know there probably are a lot more extraction shooters that have been released, but these felt like the bigger ones and the ones that I felt were more in line with Escape from Tarkov and being able to compare their player bases to others. And I don't really want to talk about Delta Force just yet because they haven't released. That'll be in December of this year, but we've got something similar to Delta Force to talk about and that's Call of Duty DMZ. And it made its debut November 14th, 2022, which I, uh, I surprisingly enjoyed. It took some of the fun arcade action that Call of Duty had to offer and injected some of that sweet, sweet extraction euphoria you got when you extracted from a match. The gunplay was smooth, the action was fast, and the bodies hit the floor faster than you can scream, No! No, my loot! Ah! 
A lot of the time leading up to the launch of DMZ, some of us are speculating on what they take from Tarkov and if they're going to fuck it up or not. And to everyone's surprise, they didn't. And it was good. I completed the battle pass within a couple of weeks and there really wasn't much content after that. I found myself itching to come back every chance I got, but I didn't want to play the game solo and that's what kind of killed it for me. The matches were fast though and the system was set up in a way that you didn't really feel like you lost anything unless you're using one of your custom loadouts. DMZ was kind of a casual take on Tarkov. So let's go over some of the strengths and weaknesses that DMZ brought to the table. Strengths. The gunplay was top notch, movement was fast and intuitive, sniping felt like sniping in this game, the parachute was fun to use in every scenario, and the matches felt even for the most part. Weaknesses. The cheating situation was really bad in DMZ, the store started to release skins that were pay to win, tasks were annoyingly hard to do and wiped every season, and there was absolutely no fucking endgame. Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. Do you think that with all the experience that Infinity Ward has, that they'd be able to develop a good extraction shooter and keep it alive? But surprisingly, they couldn't. But then again, the only COD game mode that people are loyal to are Zombies and Warzone. There isn't really a way to know their exact numbers, or any numbers for that matter, but I'd assume based off of how most Call of Duty trends go, most players move on once the new game drops and it's been two games since then. So next on the list of this soon to be potentially dead games is Grey Zone Warfare, which launched into early access on April of this year, 2024. This game had and still has a lot of promise, and when it first launched I honestly thought that it'd be a Tarkov killer, but not because of the development team or because there was a lot of buzz around the game. It was simply because everyone was sick and tired of BSG treating their community like the dirt beneath their heels. Grey Zone Warfare launched during the Unheard Edition debacle, which had the entire community on fire. Everyone was simply just waiting for a replacement or something better to come along. Grey Zone took a different approach to the extraction shooter genre. Instead of being a raid system, you are put into a server with a persistent world where you can see other players running around on the map while you fly through the environment aboard a helicopter. Not only that, but the task and healing systems were completely different. And the greatest part about the game was that the world was fun as hell to explore. So what went wrong with Grey Zone Warfare and why did it fail? Here are some of the strengths and weaknesses. Strengths. The game was incredibly fun at the start Good gunplay, scopes are clean and easy to use, unique tasks and healing system, open persistent world, and a beautiful environment to look at as you traverse in a helicopter across the map. Weaknesses The game is not optimized in the slightest. Hard to get back into the game when you disconnect from your squad, buggy AI, buggy UI, lack of an endgame, low loot spawns, poor price point, Cheaters in an unbalanced PvP mode. <laughs> All of these are forgivable for the most part on their own because it's still an early access with a small team, but all of these things combined with a team that seems to be moving at the rate of molasses are unacceptable and that is why you see this game slowly dying. I hope this game makes a comeback with a very large patch. Honestly, I was a little heartbroken when I saw how badly it was doing. I thought it was a very unique extraction shooter with some decent ideas. But performance is a really big one. You gotta get that under control, especially at a price point of $44.99. Yikes. Hot off the heels of Grey Zone Warfare, we've got Arena Breakout Infinite, which is by no means another escape from Tarkov clone. There was a pretty big controversy that happened surrounding the weapon models and some of the buildings in Arena Breakout but that was disproven by the Arena Breakout developers, or at least attempted to disprove. Personally, I don't really have a horse in the race or any skin in the game. I'm of the opinion that as long as a better product comes out, that's all I really care about. For the most part, it handles like Tarkov. There isn't really much to say about it other than that they streamlined a lot of the gameplay, and they made it a lot easier. Not to say the game doesn't have its letdowns and keyboard smashing moments because I've had a couple of those before while playing. But I just couldn't shake the feeling that the game felt like plastic. You know, when you get that feeling that something just feels cheap when you're holding it in your hands. 
Like it doesn't have that heft or metal or something that's well put together. Shut the fuck up. No one cares. Know your fucking place. Trash. That's just how I felt whenever I played Arena Breakout. But before we shit on the game, let's go through some of the strengths and then talk about the weaknesses. Strengths. They streamlined the healing process completely, making it easier and faster to heal. Quality of life changes like map and ally markers, easier to make money. They added lockdown zones. You basically pay money to enter into a zone and covert ops cannot join your raid. Covert ops are pretty much just, they're basically scavs. Insurance is easier to get back when your ally brings it out for you. And there is a lot more I could talk about, but I feel like you kind of get the picture. Weaknesses. Cheaters are running rampant in this game. This game was a mobile game before they made the PC port. The secure container costs real money and the fact that the devs lied about the monetization of the game. It's pay to win. When the game was in closed beta, I was completely enthralled with it. And I was thinking, man, if Tarkov had all these quality of life changes, maybe I'd go back. And then the interview came out with one of the head developers of the game. And they basically said that there is no way to get ahead with real life money. This was the cherry on top of the cake. Arena Breakout was not a pay to win game. That was until they released the game. And now it's very clear and apparent that there was pay to win features. It's kind of hard to say whether this game will die or not. It's got a very successful mobile counterpart, which makes me think that some people from mobile will come to PC. It's a, it's a really weird situation. And not to say that everything is pay to win, it's still the same concept of RMTing while on escape from Tarkov. Just because you've got good equipment doesn't make you a good player. Your gear won't replace your game sense. And I know it won't change, so it is what it is, but I really hoped that Arena Breakout would be different. Clearly, I was too naive because the company that it's owned by is Tencent, the EA of China. We're starting to see more and more extraction shooters crop up, and we've already seen one of them being canceled. And we already know of a couple of them already being worked on. For example, Bungie's Marathon is currently being developed and Midnight Society's Dead Drop, not sure where that game is exactly since the Dr. Diddler controversy a couple of months ago. But we'll have to wait and see. In any case, we're bound to see more extraction shooters in the future. It seems like since Tarkov blew up, everyone wants to try their hand at the genre. Kind of like how PUBG made a litany of battle royales when it released. PUBG walked so that Fortnite could run sort of thing. And I want to circle back to the reason why a lot of these games failed. You start to look into the actual studios that developed some of these games and you start to understand why. Hunt Showdown was developed by Crisis Games, the same people who developed the Crisis series and made their own engine. So they have a long history of developing first person shooters. No wonder Hunt Showdown is doing so well. They know how to make solid gameplay and navigate some of the pitfalls to come with FPS games. The Cycle was developed by Jaeger, a solid studio who made Spec Ops Align, a game that's still sought after for a gaming list in 2024, but they don't have any FPS shooters under their belt. In fact, they haven't really made anything since Spec Ops Align besides co-developing on Dead Island 2, Outriders, Dune Awakening, and Hyenas, which was cancelled by Sega. So they thought that they'd try their hands at an extraction shooter? Huh. Marauders was developed by Small Impact Games, and they don't seem to have any other games that they're working on besides phone games. No shade there, of course, but my point still stands when it comes to gaming trends and chasing them. Reinstalling it and going back to it, it feels... It feels really janky, and honestly, I was getting motion sick from how the controls are, so maybe it wasn't as good as I remember. Call of Duty DMZ was developed by Infinity Ward, and DMZ wasn't really a mode that was supposed to stick around. I'm sure they were just trend chasing like they always do not really trying to innovate just shovel slop if it works it works i don't think i need to go through their previous portfolio of work to really prove that i'm sure you know a shareholder walked into the room and was like oh wow let's make an extraction shooter and then everyone was just like oh yeah dude that sounds great that's a brand new idea 
yeah, that's just, I thought that's pretty much just how, just exactly how it went, you know. Grey Zone Warfare is being developed by Madfinger Games, and it's the same thing. They don't have any other games they've worked on besides a handful of Android games, and maybe something notable like Shadowgun Legends. I've never actually heard of it personally, but if you have, let me know in the comments down below. I'm, I'm very curious. And of course, we've got Arena Breakout Infinite, which was developed by a studio owned by Tencent. More fun studios. They developed the Arena Breakout for the phone, so all they had to do was develop it for PC. They had the blueprint, they just needed to build it. And I'm sure I'll have some developers tell me in the comments that it's not that easy. And it's not, but at the same time, they weren't really starting from scratch. That's all I'm saying. Gaming trends are a hit or miss. Sometimes you see a game skyrocket to popularity, like Among Us, because of a gaming trend and then falls off in a very, very steep way. And sometimes you see a Fortnite that innovates and somehow keeps their content fresh. And you can kind of see that with the studios who have experience like VSU with Escape from Tarkov and Crytek with Hunt Showdown. I think a lot of the success that they've had can be attributed to the previous FPS games that they've made. It's not a direct line, but I believe it's a point on the graph to say the least. You can't just look at all these studios with no experience with FPS games and just shrug your shoulders. But the weirdest part about it is that Escape from Tarkov has the bare minimum of one of these weaknesses for each of these games that I've listed. But before we get into those negatives, let's take a look at some of the strengths the game has like we did with all the other ones. It's only fair. Strengths. Immersion. Bar none, EFT has the best immersion on the market. Sound design, most notably the gun sounds and grenades. Map design, they put a lot of effort into their maps and they put small little details into locations that you would not expect. Intense gunfights. I still get nervous whenever I spot another player in the raid. The lore of the game and how deep it goes and straight up the fact that the game is made by a Russian company. It gives an entirely new and fresh perspective on the extraction shooter genre. Weaknesses, and this is gonna be a long and lengthy list. The developers straight up lied about EOD and tried to cover it up while one of their biggest streamers caught it live on stream. Getting into an interesting thing that we noticed on stream today. Uh -huh. So originally, I have an archived webpage of their website describing right. the Edge of Darkness edition when you buy it. And it says, included in the edition, free access to all subsequent DLC parentheses, season pass, such as Escape from Tarkov Arena. That page- So they are categorizing DLC as alternate modes of the game. Yes, but that, like, I read that exact description on the webpage today, and then yeah. soon after the page was updated and they removed the part that says such as Escape from Tarkov Arena and it now just says free access to all subsequent DLC parentheses season pass. Could you link me that thing so yes. I could just see it? Yeah. There are a lot of annoying ass bugs in the game, including gunsmith errors, matching errors, and game breaking bugs while in raid. The game is not optimized by any means. It still runs like shit even if you have a decent PC. The price point for the game, while still in beta, is atrocious and the upgrades are straight up pay to win. BSG is notoriously biased with streamer reports and will false flag your account based off their word. Or I could kill him but I pushed him and finished him off with two shots to the ankle. As I was looting the body I was shocked to find out he was already level 53 and a Sherpa. Because of this I decided to check if he was a streamer. And the thread goes on to talk about how after killing Rangar, Rangar talked about how he was killed by a hacker and then went to report him saying that this guy was a cheater that he would have him banned from Tarkov within 10 minutes, grabbed a clip, the raid ID, the guy's username, and sent it off to somebody over at BSG in a DM. I think I can put my whole body back on before this guy even gets to me. Oh, he's just cheating. No, oh, I'm just getting him banned. Okay. Oh. Ah. T minus how many minutes until that guy's banned? Probably 10. The customer service is practically non existent, and the cheaters are only getting worse every single wipe. With all of these issues, why did it sink all these other games but still hasn't sunk Escape from Tarkov? What makes this such a special game and an outlier? I don't think any of us will ever truly understand, 
but I've got a pretty good guess and it's probably not what you'd expect. Have you ever heard of the sunk cost fallacy before? I'm going to give you a straight up definition and then break it down. The sunk cost fallacy means that we are making irrational decisions that lead to suboptimal outcomes. We are focused on our past investments instead of our present. It means you don't want those last 2000 hours in Tarkov to be for nothing. So you keep playing, thinking that you're building towards something. Like a gambler who spent thousands of dollars thinking they're going to hit a big one day, but they won't if they quit now. I think that's one of the big reasons why a lot of the player base has stuck with the game. The game also gives off that cult-like vibe. Astrum are, in old language, a couple thousand years ago, disciples. Those who are trying to prepare themselves for entry into the evolutionary level above human, synonymous with the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Escape from Tarkov is often referred to as the Dark Souls of FPS games, which makes you think you've achieved something if you have completed a certain task or farm a lot of money. And I feel like that's where the sunk cost fallacy appears. If you quit Tarkov, you feel like you're going to lose your edge and you're going to lose your game sense. So you keep going, even though you've been killed by a cheater twice or three times in a day inching you little by little until you finally snap and then cope and go back to farming on your scab. And why do you do it? Because you've already spent thousands of hours in the game and you don't want that time to be for absolutely nothing. But to be fair, the game does a really, really good job of keeping you reeled in. The game is incredibly immersive and the sound design is on point. Besides Delta Force and Hunt Showdown, I really can't remember a single other game that drew me in just because of the sound. The world feels completely lived in. When I look at an enemy in Arena Breakout, I don't really even want to call it out. I just kind of shoot. But in Tarkov, I want to make the callouts and I want to continue to be immersed in the gameplay. Despite the cheaters, the shitty pricing, annoying ass bugs, the toxic player base, and unoptimized gameplay, I still dealt with it. I don't play Escape from Tarkov anymore, but I can understand where someone would be coming from. I was sucked in for 8,000 hours and it becomes a part of you. A lot of those hours were due to sunk cost fallacy, feeling like if I took a break, I'd lose my edge. And I don't really regret it, but now I understand it. In conclusion, I believe that all these games failed for a reason. They were chasing a trend that they didn't fully understand and they couldn't get a hold of the cheating situation. You can't blame them for it entirely, but you sure shit can't congratulate them on it either. The people who are still playing Escape from Tarkov are mostly dealing with all the problems the game has because of the sunk cost fallacy and are trying to cope about the cheaters. They've already gone through so much shit, what's another bucket to the pile? Maybe it'll get better someday, maybe it won't, who knows. But anyways, thanks for watching or possibly listening to my small deep dive into extraction shooters. I hope you learned something about some of these games and even if you didn't, I appreciate your eyeballs taking a peek. I really, really do enjoy doing these videos and I hope that I can make the next one even better. If you guys found this video helpful in any way, shape, or form, make sure you guys hit me the like, comment, or simply just subscribe. I promise it won't cost you a single skibbity, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.